My name is Matt Seaman. I'm the Executive Director of the Consortium for Service Innovation and have the great honor and privilege of being somebody who has spent the last three or four years really deep diving into intelligence warming and learning so much from our member companies that are playing with the concepts of intelligence warming. So today we're going to cover a little bit on why intelligent swarming seems to be gaining so much momentum in the industry and why it is a better way to think about a smarter way to think about aligning our work and people. Some of the emerging design techniques and practices that the member companies have really discovered and operationalized. And as Kelly mentioned, some of the great new resources that we have available for everybody on intelligent swarming. For those of you that are not familiar with the Consortium for Service Innovation, we're a not-for-profit alliance of companies really focused on how do we innovate and improve customer engagement. And it's through all of our member companies testing different things, trying things that allows us to develop models like KCS, which is what we're probably the most known for, intelligent swarming, the predictive customer engagement, leadership and adaptive organization, all of the fun work that consortium members get to play with. We're made up of 65 member companies. This is a, a snapshot of a few of those companies. And as I mentioned, it really is these companies that are doing the brave work and where we're learning how intelligent swarming is working in the industry. It is the consortium members, both that are implementing the specific parts of intelligent swarming that we're learning from, but also the greater industry in how member companies are thinking about contribution and how employees contribute to overall success. How do we measure the way people are having an impact? What are some of the ways the self-service community and using communities actually in services are working? And it's all these operational learnings, all these different perspectives that allow us to bring together to develop things like intelligent swarming. So I wanna say thank you to all of our member companies for the amazing work that they're doing and the bravery they have to implement and test new ideas that we then collectively learn from and share knowledge on. So before we kind of start deep diving in, intelligence swarming is truly and really about how we solve problems in the most efficient way. And we do that by getting the right work on the right people as fast as we can, getting the right people to the right people to work on new issues, and changing how we think about contribution to overall success to inspire people, to tap into the intrinsic motivators to inspire people to really grow and contribute to the overall success of our company. So I would say over the last couple of years, intelligence warming is getting a lot more, um, we're hearing a lot more about it in the industry. And it really is proving to be a better way to think about how we organize work and people and a lot of it is because of the accelerating complexity that we're seeing. When support services really started to be developed 30, 40, maybe even 50 years ago now, it started as a way to say, we don't need to be sending people on site to fix problems anymore. We can have phone centers, we can centralize operation centers where people are calling in. But at that time, it was really about supporting one application, answering questions about one product that we have, but over the last 50 years, our environments have gotten far more complicated. The number of applications, the number of software applications we're asked to integrate with are growing and growing at an ex exponential rate these days. The speed at which our own products change is growing. As SaaS applications have become more and more of the norm, we're adding new features, we're changing the products faster and faster than we ever have in the past. We're adding new products to our portfolio. All of these products integrate with other products. We're no longer living in a world where we have one single product we're supporting, but really we're being asked to support this incredible network of different applications of different features. And this requires a much broader skill set than we've ever needed in the world. On top of that, we're also asked to do things like reduce our customers' effort, improve employee engagement, increase customer success and loyalty. With the explosion of SaaS applications, customer success and loyalty have become a function all into themselves. <clears throat> In order to you know, get customers to renew their SaaS applications, we need to make sure they're successful. If they're successful, we have expansion opportunities, greater renewal rates, which obviously drives new uh, revenue streams for companies. So we're asked to do all these things 
on top of the fact that our entire environment has got more complicated and more complex. And we're facing all kinds of dynamic forces. We have ever-changing technology landscapes. <clears throat> We've talked about it. We have, on average now, a company has 115 different SaaS applications. That's up from 16 just four years ago. On average, companies have 250 plus software applications that they're asked to um, integrate. Organizations are using 30 to 40 different applications to try and get their jobs done. This technology landscape is just getting more and more complicated around us. And we're facing growing customer expectations and those expectations really aren't set by us anymore. They're set by all of the different interactions we're having with technology. We often talk to member companies about engagement, customer success, customer loyalty, satisfaction, customer expectations. And the discussions often turn to how my own home and the applications I'm using in my home seem more advanced than some of the applications I'm being asked to use when I go to work. So our expectations are no longer set by us as a company, they're set by the world around us and companies like how easy it is to buy stuff from Amazon and get stuff in the mail in a day or two days. Those are where our expectations are being set. How do we react to those? And a shortage of skills, uh, the great resignation is the latest buzzword and tagline, right? We're all hearing about the shifting workforce, people are leaving and moving to new companies. <clears throat> and this is all based on our shifting work environments. All of this is compounded into really poor customer satisfaction. 61% uh, of companies say that their customers are very satisfied, but only 23% of those customers actually say they're satisfied at all with the, these companies. So we're just facing a lot of challenges. And to face those challenges, we're almost doubling down on thinking about how do we make our silos and our hierarchies more efficient? But silos really separate us. They separate us from our customers. They separate us from other departments in the company. And even within a support and services organization, they separate us into different levels and different hierarchies and different structures. And we often design these hierarchies to kind of maximize the efficiency within one. We do a lot to maximize the efficiency of our level one support team, our level three support team. But we don't do that in the context of how do we make the entire system more efficient. We do it in a way that says, how do I make this silo or this hierarchy more efficient? And this really limits our people's ability to contribute to overall success. Our hierarchies and silos limit people's ability to grow and develop. And really, this does nothing but create rework, inefficiencies, frustrations for our customers, frustrations for our people. It is just a poor way to think about structuring ourselves to deal with the complex environments that we're all living in these days. And this is being borne out in some of the latest surveys and studies. If you haven't read the 2021 State of the Workforce, State of the American Workforce by Gallup, or the 2021 State of the Global Workforce by Gallup, I highly recommend looking them up and reading them. Really rich information in there about kind of the state of the work, workplace. But what they're finding is that 60 to 70% of the workforce is disengaged from the intent of the business or the organization that they work for. So think about if only 30% of your people actually are engaged with the job they have, how much inefficiency is being added by people kind of checking boxes and not fully being engaged. At the same time, companies are using less than 40% of the skills that their people have. I know as an employee, if I'm only using 40% or less of the skills that I have, it'd be hard for me to think that I'm super engaged in the intent and the purpose of my company when I'm just not able to use all the skills that I can bring to the table. And today, 51% of the workforce is either actively looking for new opportunities or open to new opportunities that come to them. So more than half of the workforce is open to moving jobs. These things really are playing out and you know we're seeing some anecdotal information from our member companies where they're starting to see attrition rates grow, they're starting to see employee engagement scores drop. So really the way that we're structuring ourselves, the way we're doubling down on our hierarchies is having a big impact on our organizations and our people. So we think about the traditional service model because nowhere, uh, I'd say more than in support, are we good at building hierarchies and silos and structures that inhibit our people? So we think about the traditional service model, level one, level two, level three support, 
maybe you call them tier one, tier two, tier three, maybe frontline, backline, escalation teams, whatever taglines or tag words you put on them, they are still building hierarchies and structures within support. And we end up passing work around. So in this model, all work follows the same path and work begins at our level one team. We assign an initial owner. Some percentage of that work gets solved and gets closed with the level one team. A lot of times that's known issues that we should actually be capturing with KCS and moving to our self-service tools. And the things that we can't solve in level one get thrown over the wall to level two. The customer gets a new contact, rework begins to validate the level one actions to ask for more information from the customer to try and figure out what's going on. Some work gets resolved, what doesn't get resolved gets thrown over the wall again to a level three team or an escalation team. It's another new contact for the customer. More rework begins to validate the level one, level two actions. The customer is asked the same questions over and over again. Super inefficient to just throw work over the wall and pass work from silo to silo. And sometimes we even pass work back. Oh, you sent it to the escalation team, but it didn't have the right information in it. So I'm gonna pass it back to level two to get more information or level two passes it back to level one. Bob Blackburn, when he was at Cisco, kind of coined the phrase that we want to play catch, not ping pong. Support organizations are passing work around. They're throwing things over the wall. They're playing ping pong with their work instead of catching the work and owning it to resolution. And then we ultimately pass some work on to our development and our engineering teams. And a very small percentage of product usage is ever seen by our development and engineering teams. Support services teams have a great huge, expansive understanding of how customers are actually using our products and services. We filter so much of that by time uh, development and engineering gets it, they're only seeing a very small percentage of that usage. And when we send problems to development or engineering, the urgency has already grown because we've passed the customer through many levels. We've done lots of rework. By time it gets to development engineering, the customer's hair is on fire. They really are upset that their issue isn't being solved. And development engineering is now under massive amounts of pressure to jump through hoops, pulling them away from understanding what customers are trying to accomplish and developing software to go jump on all these massive urgent issues. And throughout this, we're limiting skills transfer. So when we throw things over the wall from level one to level two and level two to level three, we're not transferring skills. Level one never understands how level three solves the issue. There's no skills transfer between the different levels of support. We see some organizations that have adopted little pieces of agile in their support organizations where they might have a stand-up call. So, or uh, you know, a, a daily stand-up, a weekly stand-up where level one can collect the questions they have and then go to a meeting and ask level two. But all this is doing is making it so one, we're losing some of the context because we're not doing things in the moment of our need. We are now just trying to solve the issue. We're not actually trying to learn from each other. We're creating more and more backlog because I still have work coming in the front door and now I have to wait, and sit on things in order to get help from the other levels. Really just an inefficient way to transfer knowledge and get issues resolved. And on top of all this, our customers absolutely hate this, right? Why can't I get help when I need it from the first person I talk to? Why do I have to get passed around? I've already sent this information. I've already had this discussion. Why do I need to send it again? How did it take so long to understand this was even a problem that now you have to get development and engineering involved? Our customer experience is changing. It's really difficult for us to stick to a brand promise, stick to a customer experience, stick to a great um, experience with our customers when we're bouncing work around to lots of different contacts. <clears throat> when we're building these models, we really are forgetting about the customer as we optimize our silo, as we optimize our escalation processes, we're doing it through a very small lens and our customers are forgotten as we go through this process. We often look at these things thinking, you know, if I can make it faster to get my stuff from level one to level three, if level three can be more efficient, that means I'm gonna make my customers happier, but it really doesn't make your customers happy because you've already made them pretty dissatisfied by the time they get to these new silos and hierarchies within our organizations. So in our, new environments with the complexity we have to support with the adaptive nature that we need in our organizations, this static linear hierarchy based model really needs to give way 
to a very dynamic, fluid, adaptive uh, way of thinking where our organizations are based on a network of people. The traditional model has absolutely outlived its usefulness and we need to move to a much more dynamic way of thinking about our, our work, much more dynamic way of thinking about our resources and using a network and thinking about our people as a network instead of a hierarchy and a structured leveled support model. So how do we do that? <clears throat> so we need to think about our environments slightly differently. We really need to think about how do we develop an environment that allows us to optimize our resources, tapping into all of those skills across all of the resources we have. How do we build the breadth and depth of skills that we need as we're adding new features to the software, as we're adding new technologies, new integrations? How do we transfer that knowledge rapidly around the organization in an on-demand real-time way? How do we enable a sense of self-empowerment? How do we make people feel like they're a part of a greater purpose, a part of a bigger organization and shift our focus to the customer? We do that with this idea of a network-based organization. And adaptive organizations can really sense and respond to complexity. Uh, we have a body of work in the consortium where we've taken this idea of complex adaptive systems from system engineering and really applied it to organizations. And we can build complex adaptive organizations that are able to sense and respond to the changing environments around them. That does not work if you're thinking about your organization in a static hierarchy way. You can do it if you're thinking about your organization in a never ending learning cycle with people as a dynamic unbounded network. So how does intelligent swarming get us there? Because intelligent swarming is designed to solve all of these problems. So intelligent swarming is about improving relevance, expanding reach, increasing diversity, and enabling collaboration. So when we talk about these things, and these things come together to work in a system, our interactions are emergent based on the work we have. So we're not driving all of our work through a single linear process of throwing things over the wall, but how we handle any work situation shifts based on the work situation at hand. We leverage this entire network of talented people to support each other. So when we have new, complex, complicated type issues to solve, we tap into the talent of all of our people to help solve these problems. While we're doing that, we're increasing the diversity of the entire organization. We're literally doing real-time knowledge share, uh, sharing perspective, sharing skill sets. So it allows us to tap into and develop a broad range of all of the skills we need across the organization in a dynamic, much faster way. And all of this is supported by really removing the arbitrary boundaries that we build in organizations. We build these arbitrary boundaries. Arbitrary boundaries don't exist without us structuring them and thinking about them. We want to make it as easy and as low effort as possible to work across these arbitrary boundaries. An intelligent swarming system helps us build an organization that taps into making sure things are done based on relevance, that we have this broad reach across an expansive network, that we're building the diversity we need in our organizations, and we're doing that by enabling collaboration. Adopters are seeing amazing results. It is wholly beneficial. Uh, intelligence swarming is improving our customers' experience. We are resolving problems faster. We are seeing increases in customer satisfaction and loyalty. Our support analysts love it. They are uh, able to grow their skills faster. They're able to tap into other people to help them grow. We're uh, seeing some results like uh, Red Hat saw a 50% decrease in the time it took to train and get people up to speed. Uh, all of our operational metrics start to get better. So we're reducing the time to resolve, which increases our capacity. We're resolving these multi-technology complex issues much faster. Uh, on our website, we have some case studies and one will be getting published shortly by Akamai. Akamai is one of the latest companies to be playing with intelligent swarming and is seeing some uh, amazing results with their, their implementation. So all of the stuff we're talking about is backed up by real companies putting these things into operational experiences and seeing the results. So how does intelligence warming actually work? Uh, intelligence warming is not random. It is not chaos. It is structured. We have processes, we have measures, 
Um, it is designed, it's a designed model that allows you to implement it and tap into all of these great resources. And we talk about it kind of having three practices. So there's three practices to intelligent swarming. There's connect, collaborate, and recognize. Connect is about making work visible to the best resources to solve it on first touch. Massive operational efficiencies if we can get the right work to the right people as fast as possible. In order to do that, we need to make highly relevant work visibility to the right people. When people need help to solve problems, we wanna make it very easy to raise my hand to ask for help. We wanna make it super easy for people to opt in and help. We wanna get help from anyone with the knowledge to help us. We don't want it to be you know, super structured in how we can request help and how we can offer help. We wanna make it easy. Support organizations are already collaborate, collaborative. Our teams are already collaborating. We wanna make it easy to collaborate and have that be a part of the job instead of all the back channels people are using to try and solve work. And then recognize is about recognizing all the diverse skills and competencies that people bring to the table to be successful. And shifting away from thinking about the activity-based way we recognize people to understanding their history of contribution to the overall success of the organization. So these are the three practices. Um, the new practices guide, which we'll talk about, is structured around these three practices with design techniques for each one of them. When we talk about some of the design techniques, um, so thinking about connect, which is about making work visible to the most relevant people to solve an issue as quickly as po possible. There's really two main parts of this. There are people profiles and our work profiles. When we talk about people profiles, we want to know the identity, right? Who somebody is. We already have all of this in our CRM systems and in our in our tools, right? Who somebody is, their name, phone number, not just our internal people, but our customers. Uh, people profiles span both the requester or the customer and our internal people. Internal people can be requesters too. We want to capture the skills people have, both broad and deep. Support services organizations often have a very good understanding of the technical skills of the people, but we want to expand our thinking of skills to all of the skills people bring to the table. In support and services organizations, not only do we need technical skills, but we also need communication skills, maybe empathy or understanding of the customer and the challenges and the um, pressures that our customers are under. So what are all of these skills that it takes for us to be successful in a support and services organization? And reputation is a big part of people profiles. I'll touch a little bit on reputation in recognize as well, but a reputation model is the history of contribution of how somebody is leveraging their skills to contribute to the overall success of an organization as seen by other people. And our work profiles are the attributes of the work itself, product, feature, module, impact to the customer, severity, priority, all of the kind of things that come with a work request. In order to make this work, we wanna think about a common classification model. So we need to know a lot about the people in our network. We need to know a lot about the work in the network. If we use shared attributes across these things, it makes it easier for us to match them. So we don't wanna have completely different ways we think about products and people and completely different ways that customers think about our products. Internally, we think about our products. Um, we've worked with some member companies where the way the customer looks at their product and the internal way they structure their product are almost 100% different. And somehow the support teams are trying to translate when a customer is calling in on something, what are they actually calling in on? Because we don't use any of the same names in our external marketing material and sales material that we use in our internal material. How do we align these things and try to make these attributes the same? If we know a lot about our people, if we know a lot about the work and we've used a common, common classification model, then we have a visibility engine, which is nothing more than a decision processing engine that applies rules and requirements to make the right work visible to the right people. Now, there are some organizations that are using technology to do this. Early in an intelligence forming adoption, oftentimes this is done um, manually. Um, one of our members who is implementing intelligence forming and has been for the last year, actually took some of their most skilled resources and put them into a triage role early in the intelligence forming implementation so that their most skilled people could learn what are we missing that 
about our customers? What are we missing in our work requests? What are we missing in our work profiles, in our common classification models to help then develop a technology engine that could do those matchings uh, automatically? So there's lots of different ways to approach a visibility engine, but it really is a decision processing engine. So Connect is all about saying, how do I get the right people on the right work as fast as possible? possible to solve the work on first touch. I'd say one of the myths about intelligent swarming is that all of a sudden we're opening it up where all of the work has multiple people touching it. Most work is still solved by the first person that touches it because they have the skills to find the information they need, do the troubleshooting that's needed. We're not looking to collaborate on all of our work. We're only looking to collaborate on the work that needs collaboration. So the practice of connect is where one of the biggest efficiency gains is in intelligence swarming by getting the right work to the right people as fast as we can. When we do need help and we want to collaborate, we want to make it as easy as possible for a team of people to solve new issues. Uh, intelligence swarming is really excellent at solving new issues. So how do we make it easy for people to ask for help? We want requests for assistance to be made visible to anybody with the knowledge or skills to help me. How do we make that as easy as possible? And there are different levels of collaboration. A lot of times people start thinking about collaboration as only solving those super escalated, super challenging issues. But collaboration could be as simple as me popping my head up over the cube wall and asking a very simple question of somebody. We want to enable all of those types of collaboration. Uh, in the practice guide, we talk about seven process scenarios to think through. They're not the only process scenarios for collaboration, but it's a starting point to think about what are the different scenarios where collaboration may help us and what might that look like. Once we ask for help, we need to make it super easy to offer help. And when we talk about offering help, there's two dimensions to offering for help. There is visibility to the relevant help requests that I can help with. So how can I opt in to help when somebody is asking a question? But also, how can I have visibility to all of the work that I might be able to help on, not just help requests? Uh, at one of our member companies, we were talking about intelligent swarming and talking about the impact it could have in their organization. And one of the senior resources in the room said that her favorite part of the day was when she was done with her shift and could take maybe half an hour or 45 minutes to kind of go look at the cases that were left over at the end of the day that other people had in their logs and just offer some assistance and just send some quick notes saying, oh, hey, try these two things or, oh, there's a knowledge article that I think might apply to this but maybe not, you might need a little bit more context. But her favorite part of the day was helping other people solve their work. So when we think about how do we get people to offer help and what should their day look like, we wanna make it so that our resources that can offer help can see all of the visible work and offer help because people, especially in services teams and tech support teams, IT service management teams, usually like helping people. So if we make it easy for them to help people, they will opt in to help people and we'll see great efficiency gains by not having cases sitting around, turning into back, backlog. If I can spend a few minutes, I can spend an hour a day helping other people solve their work. And then the third part of Collaborate is capturing what we learn. Um, there's a lot of rich content that is, uh, in the collaborative session, it is on the owner of the work to capture that knowledge. So intelligence swarming, if you're familiar with KCS, absolutely taps into KCS. And as the owner, if I'm interacting with knowledge, it's my responsibility to make sure that that knowledge is accurate and up to date. So if I'm the owner of work, while I'm working on it, if there is information being exchanged in a collaboration set, uh, session that will help me update a knowledge article with either more context uh, or to create a new knowledge article, it's the owner of the work that is responsible for capturing the knowledge from the collaboration session. So these are the three things that make up the practice of collaborate. When we talk about recognize, we wanna recognize all the skills that make us successful, all the things people are doing to contribute to success. Um, we talk about success indicators. How is intelligence forming impacting the overall business? 
The business outcomes don't change in intelligence swarming. This is a discussion that I often have on, well, what are the new business outcomes that we want with intelligence swarming? Intelligence swarming doesn't really change our desired top level business outcomes. It changes how we reach those outcomes. We still care about revenue. We still care about budgets. We still care about customer satisfaction, customer effort, employee engagement. All of these top level outcomes stay the same. What intelligence swarming does is, is changes how we reach those outcomes. So our success indicators, we want to attach our success indicators to intelligence swarming and think about how intelligence swarming is going to impact our business outcomes. Our health indicators, how is intelligence swarming functioning? What are the key performance indicators for intelligence swarming? And how do they fit into our overall organizational uh, key performance indicators? If you're in a tech support organization, incoming case volume is still an indicator. It is still something we need to pay attention to. Intelligence swarming doesn't replace those indicators. Intelligence swarming has its own indicators that we need to figure out how to build into our overall organization indicators. And what is the health of our intelligence swarming in implementation? How effective is our visibility engine at getting the right work visible to the right people? How effective is our collaboration processes at making it easy for people to connect and solve issues? These are all the indicators that we want to think about for intelligence swarming. And perhaps the biggest one is contribution. How are our individuals and our teams creating value and shifting away from our activity-based measures, um, which we, we talk all the time about, right? We don't want to put goals on activities. So how do we shift away from the value I'm contributing to the organization is by how many cases a week I'm closing uh, to what is the overall contribution I have to the success of the organization? A scenario that we like to talk about is, you know, two people are working on a very complex issue. They've been working on it for three days, a week, a month, doesn't really matter. But these two people have been working diligently on this work and you know they've collected all kinds of log files they've done all kind of diagnostics and then a third person walks by and that person hears these two people talking and says oh you know what i think you just need to do these two things and that solves the issue well in that scenario who created the most value for the organization was it the two people who spent weeks figuring out and building all the context around the issue or was it the person who happened to walk by and because all that context was there knew how to solve the problem all three of them contributed to the overall success. It's difficult to specifically point out and say, well, you know, this one person is the one who closed the case. And since they closed the case, they contributed the most success because they closed the case versus the other people that helped solve that issue as well. So we have to think about contributions slightly differently. We talk quite a bit about badges and ways of doing contribution. Um, if you have ever attended or uh, been engaged with a consortium, you know our hatred of leaderboards and how leaderboards really drive poor performance and poor behaviors because there's one winner and everybody else in the organization is losing. Everyone can achieve the highest level of overall contribution. Um, I love thinking about the belts of Six Sigma, where literally every single person on the planet could be a black belt in Six Sigma. It's difficult and challenging to become a black belt, but with the right competencies, the right experiences, the right skills, anybody can become a black belt. There's no limit on it. But as you move up the recognition scale or as you get different badges, those badges maybe are harder to achieve, but anybody can achieve them. So it's wholly beneficial to an organization to design their contribution and recognition models around the fact that everybody can reach the highest level of recognition, everybody can contribute, but maybe it takes a lot to get to that high skill level or that high recognition level. And just a note on reputation models. We believe reputation models are a very powerful tool for companies to use to build contribution and recognition models. Um, Stack Overflow is a great example of leveraging uh, reputation models to recognize people's contribution. But a reputation model is a rough estimate rough measurement of how much a community of people trust you based on your history of contribution. And it is just a great model to think about when looking at intelligence swarming and saying, 
the organization as a whole, the people in the organization often have a great sense of who is contributing and reputation models are a great way to design a system that let, lets us recognize the people that are contributing the most in an organization and it builds a high level of trust in the organization. So some great resources in the uh, practices guide on reputation models with links out to other organizations and examples of reputation models. All right, so thinking about this whole model, we really are moving away from this outdated static linear hierarchy based model to building dynamic fluid adaptive organizations that think of themselves as a network. So to move to this model, if we think about and change the way we look at our work and our people, we have work requests, right? We have technology coming in the front door, maybe there's three, 10, 50, who knows how many things people need to know now to support anything, but we have our, our kind of work request. And then we have our employees, which aren't in a tier, right? It's not that I'm a tier three engineer or I'm a, a level three engineer or I'm an escalation engineer. We're a group of people that have different skills and different competencies. We have new people that have very little skill and very little competencies because they just started at the company. We have people that have been in the company for 20 years that have high skills and high competencies. But I guarantee you hired somebody in the last week that knows something that somebody that's been at the company for 20 years doesn't know. So we just now have a network of people with different skills and different competencies. Because we know about the work and we know about our people, our visibility engine allows us to get the work to the right resources as fast as possible to solve it instead of driving it through a linear process where it goes to a tier one person who can't help you moves it to tier three, to tier two, moves it back to tier one, maybe moves it to a different product team because we had it in the wrong place altogether. The visibility engine allows us to get work to the right people. So a work request comes in, gets sent to the right group of people and somebody opts in to take that work. So already just doing this, we gain a lot of operational efficiency because if we get work to the right people to solve it on first touch, there's a lot less rework that happens and we solve things faster. Our customer gets to work with somebody immediately who is the right resource. If you think about you know, one of your kind of most, most experienced customers, every single time they call in, they've already done all their due, due, due diligence. We know it's going to be a big problem. Why do we make that customer go through tier one to tier two to tier three when we know they're gonna end up at tier three? These are the types of attributes that we can use in a visibility engine to get the right work to the right person. It is not that we're trying to flatten the organization. It's not that we're trying to turn our most senior people into triage engineers or frontline support people. It's we're trying to get the right work to the right people as fast as we can to solve the problem. Connect is all about getting the right work to the right people. So now we have a work owner that's working with our customer. The customer has one contact that they're working with. So their customer experience is going to be consistent. But as we're working on the request, we're working on the issue, we realize that we need other skills to come in to help us. We need other knowledge to help us solve the problem. Instead of throwing it over the wall, we make requests for help or we have people opt in to help and we bring the right resources together to pull the, the information needed to solve the customer issue or the problem at hand. And this process is emergent. So I'm not always going to the same group of people. I'm not always going to tier a tier two. I'm going to the right resources, pulling the right resources in, having people opt in to help me that have the skills needed to solve the work. So here in this scenario, we still keep our customer experience because the customer is working with the work owner. We're transferring knowledge between not only the customer and us, but also between internal resources. So all three people in this scenario are learning from the other people and we're transferring skills and making them more rounded. Um, and we're solving the problem faster because I don't have to wait for a stand-up meeting. I'm not passing it over the wall for rework to happen. It's getting accomplished much faster in our system. So Collaborate is all about pulling the right resources together when they're needed to solve problems. Collaborate is not an expert finder. Uh, the idea here isn't that we get it so that there's like three experts in the company that now are being you know, pulled in to solve every issue. We wanna bring the right people for the work that needs to get done. 
and that often is not an expert. I may just need somebody to give me some guidance on a different log file to collect or somebody to just get me unstuck. I don't need to go to an expert. So the idea behind Collaborate is not an expert finder. It's not to burden experts with all kinds of questions. It is to bring the right skills together to solve the work at hand. This is why we talk about intelligent swarming as being based on relevance because the way we're working is emergent based on the work that we're trying to get done. So we talk about this being wholly beneficial because this model really benefits everybody. Uh, our customers benefit, they're working with the right resource much faster than they do in a traditional hierarchy model. They have a consistent experience. There's a lot of reduced effort on the customer's part because we're not asking them to do the same work over and over. We just resolve issues faster. We resolve issues faster by getting it to the right people to actually solve it on first touch. And we resolve it faster by pulling the resources together to solve complex issues instead of playing ping pong and passing it around the organization two, three, four, five, ten 10 times. Employees love it. If you haven't read Daniel Pink's book, Drive, uh, it's a great, great book. We reference it quite frequently. But it really talks about mastery, autonomy, and purpose. And Intelligent swarming really taps into these things. It taps into mastery by allowing people to grow their skills. I can opt in to take work in an area that maybe I'm not super strong at, and it's a great way for me to get exposure. Uh, I get to choose some of the work. I get to opt in to work on issues that are made visible to me. I'm part of something bigger. Uh, I'm helping other people solve their issues. I'm helping the organization be more successful. And I'm being recognized for my total contribution. So just because maybe I don't take as many cases as the next person, but maybe I take more difficult cases, that now gets recognized in our uh, recognition model. So I'm recognized for my total contribution to the overall success of the company. And I mean, our business benefits are through the roof. We're reducing rework, we're reducing redundancy, we're getting more operationally efficient, our employee engagement scores go up and our customers love it and we have higher customer success. So it is a wholly beneficial model to shift away from our hierarchies to this idea of a network-based organization where we're connecting the right people to the right work, we're connecting the right people to the right people through collaboration, and we're recognizing people for their overall contribution to the success of our organization. So it's a wholly beneficial model. It works together. So our connect, collaborate, and recognize model works together. It is something where you have to be doing all three to get to true intelligence swarming. Uh, lots of people talk about collaboration and say they're doing intelligence swarming when really they're just doing collaboration. You have to be thinking about how we're connecting, collaborating, and recognizing to make the entire model work. And we've got some great new resources uh, and some great iterations on resources. The Intelligent Swarming Practices Guide has been released and is available on our website. It is broken down into core concepts, principles, the three practices, design techniques, adoption and rollout, lots of great learnings in here. It's a dynamic document. We are updating it as new members try new things and we learn. The model that we use, the way we talk about it is 100% based on member companies doing the work. None of this is made up by us. This is all operationally in place at companies and being used and we're always learning. We have a new online training and certification. So we're releasing the Intelligence Forming Fundamentals, which is you know, a self-paced interactive entry level training to you know, get people to understand kind of the benefits of intelligence swarming how intelligence swarming works, uh, a fundamental certification. So if you take the fundamentals course, look through the intelligence swarming practices guide and take the certification exam. It's a way to kind of highlight your understanding of intelligence swarming. Um, and there's new digital badges available with that certification. And all of this work is available through uh, Creative Commons, non-commercial international licensing. So the practices guide is published to the public. It is available for use by everybody um, with attribution back to the consortium. We have upcoming workshops on our website that are available through our certified trainers and a list of certified trainers because it's Creative Commons, non-commercial. This is a list of the 
uh, organizations and trainers out there that have worked with us to be able to um, work on training and implementing intelligent swarming. So please visit those resources. So that's just a, a brief update on where we are with intelligent swarming and some of the new resources available. There is a lot of rich content available on the consortium website. And we will be continuing to talk about it more and more in the coming months as more companies are playing with it.